Muy buenas tardes, todos y todas. Thank you all for being here, coming back. I think as many familiar faces who have come back for this second uh, session in our symposium, Taino, a conversation with the movement. Uh, this second session is called Genetic Science and Genealogy, Recovering Native Ancestry. And before we start, I just want to make some housekeeping remarks. If you have your cell phone, please go ahead and silence it. That said, feel free to record, take photographs, post comments on social media, and you can use the handy hashtag Taino. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have any reserved seats, so um, if you, uh, you might want to sort of cluster together as much as you can so you don't have folks climbing over you as the uh, stragglers and latecomers come in, as they always do within the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So I'm going to read a quick overview of the session so you know what to expect, and then I will invite our illustrious panelists on stage. So today, uh, you'll be hearing from um, Jessica uh, Bardale from Concordia U University. She's an expert working at the intersection of indigenous studies and genetic science. She will moderate this conversation with genetic anthropologist Deborah Bolnick from the University of Connecticut and Jada Ben Torres from Vanderbilt uh, University, along with ancient DNA specialist Hannes Schroeder from the University of Leiden uh, and also the uh, National Museum in uh, Denmark. Uh, as, as in addition, uh, we'll also have anthropologist and indigenous community planner Carlalin Yare Melendez from the Nahuaque community with us on stage. So with no further ado, please, uh, Jesse Bardell and the rest of our panelists come on stage. Can you all hear me? Order. Sheila Nagara, Jessica Bardell, Dagua Kensa Georgia Chiganela, Chicha Legi. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today. I have lots of notes, like a good academic. But Ranel kind of beat me to this whole welcoming you to the second uh, panel, though I'll still try to do that. Oh, are we in the wrong order of panel of uh, slides? Yes, you want to skip ahead. Uh, okay. Doop. Nice. <laughs> Much more interesting. <laughs> All right, so first I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Lenape lands and that today Manahata is home to hundreds of indigenous peoples from around the world, undivided by borders and walls. I pay my respect to the Lenape, their ongoing sovereignty, to other indigenous caretakers of this territory. <laughs> and to their elders who have lived here, who live here now, and who will live here in the future. As we gather to discuss the Taino peoples as well, I want to honor their leaders who come in many forms, as well as all of those who have recently become ancestors following Hurricane Maria. I would also like to thank and acknowledge our hosts, the National Museum of the American Indian, the Smithsonian <coughs> Latino Center, and the tireless efforts of Dr. Ronald Wudaman, Adrian Aldaba, and countless others behind the scenes, I would also like to thank the committee who put together the wonderful exhibit upstairs and the symposium over the past seven years, and particularly to Cristina Gonzalez for believing in my work. Right. So currently I live in Jojage, Montreal, on unceded indigenous lands traditionally cared for by the Kanenkahaga Nation. And I'm honored to be moderating this panel of my distinguished colleagues. Just to give you guys an idea of the timeline, Dr. Scalelin Melindez, Jada Ben Torres, Hannes Schroeder, and Deborah Bolnick will each in that order talk for 10 minutes, and then and in that time offering a taste of their work. I will then guide a 20 minute on stage discussion before we turn to the wonderful, thoughtful, and beautiful audience for your questions during about 20 minutes Q&A. So by the end of this session, we have learning objectives, like a good professor's class. <laughs> we hope that you will understand better, or at least maybe question more critically, the historical ongoing presence of Taino in the Caribbean, including how the people have continued despite ongoing settler colonialism into a diaspora and joined with African, Spanish, and other peoples. The unique racial and settler logics within the Caribbean and how those <coughs> compare with the logics in North America. 
the possibilities and limitations of genetic data and testing for exploring questions of identity, belonging, and presence, the complementarity of genealogical information, including understandings of kinship models and genetic data to help tell a story of the Taino, and the ethics of genetic research with and about Taino, including involving <coughs> ancestors. So who am I and how do I come here? I come to this panel through work I began in 2011, listening to the swell of dissent to scientific projects that would claim the Taino to be extinct, a notion mythologized along with Crispo Colon and the impact of settler colonialism on the Caribbean, as my distinguished colleagues discussed earlier today. At that time and for years to come, through connections, readings, and adventures, the histories and ongoing lived realities in the Caribbean and the diaspora drew my attention. For example, the Taino Genome Project that sought to reconstitute a quote-unquote pure Taino genome in order to address health disparities in present-day admixed populations, indigenous, African, European, struck me as logically quite confounding. Further inherent to it and other projects were the notions of a kind of racial or ethnic purity that is formulated in the modern present and fails to attend to the social ways that we form kin and communities, including those whose names we carry forward today and those whose names have been put upon us. I am still working through these conceptualizations of purity as well as extinction as applied to peoples, including Neanderthal and those known as homo Leri, as well as our other than human kin. Part of what makes notions of extinction possible begins with speciation or the differentiation between animal species that is extended to human groups even as we do not constitute separate racial species. Instead, indigenous peoples are flexible socio-political constitutions that change and adapt over time and through space. Importantly, indigenous peoples, we are diverse. We are diverse within our communities and among our communities. This was really highlighted to me by some colleagues, Lumbi colleagues, Melinda Maynard Lowry and Judy Cortez, uh, in various discussions, including their own community. It also brings us to an attention that the politics of recognition of who is and who is not a people who belongs to the people, that is a conversation that serves a particular settler colonial supremacy, not our communities. And Diné scholar uh, Glenn Colthard calls out how we are implicated within these politics of recognition in his recent work, Red Skin, White Masks. It also makes us attend to what are the politics of authenticity, how we determine, quote unquote, what is authentically Indian, indigenous, indijo. And again, who is served by us having these disputes? What else are we prevented from doing when we have these disputes? So this panel attends to those disputes, adaptations, and how we might reconstruct some of the history of adaptation through genetic science and genealogy, a tracing of family history that need not only attend to biological relations, who had babies with whom, but which includes other ways of making kin among and beyond humans. Which leads me to the images you see behind you and an interesting recent presentation of Taino identity. A few years ago, I traveled to visit a friend in Huaytacobuli, currently known as Dominica. And we visited with the Kalanago people, including their living village, which demonstrates and further recognizes indigenous peoples of the islands and mainlands of the Caribbean. I also went on walks to visit with the land itself, where I found the perseverance and persistence of the trees that not only continued to grow, but that were attracted to the walls abandoned by various colonizers and likely constructed by enslaved persons. To seal these walls, lime had been used, and the trees were taking back that mineral for their own use, to take over and take from these remnants, making the beauty that you see here. The power, ooh, sorry, got to the end too fast. Okay. 
The power and connection among, between those trees and the place was important. And that frames my understanding for the move by author Edgardo Miranda Rodriguez to reveal in the comic book Guardians of Infinity 3 that Groot, yes, I am Groot, yo soy Groot, that Groot, is Taino. <coughs> Recognizing our relatives is important. This information is presented in the comic book by an Afo Periquen Abuela to her grandson, reminding us of the multiple identities and communities that emerge, adapt, and continue to create histories and futures. This reveal also ties to the importance of the Sieva tree, the Taino, the Periqua, the Española, and more lands, and to connections across current species distinctions. While many may find this reference tangential, as a story indexing relations, to me it is primary to understanding the possibilities of kin and ancestors that are not confined by ideas of race, nor fixed by purity in some unknown past, nor only fixed to humans. Groot as a character is also important because he demonstrates generosity, resilience, and connections across cultures that we are able to see in these trees and how they form and continue to thrive and that we're able to see in humans as well. So, er, er, we're gonna have fun here, I think. Finally, the last picture of Sulphur Springs and a quote unquote extinct volcanic crater. Again, I think calling lands extinct in their various capacities is also problematic. This last picture of Sulphur Springs and a volcanic crater not only brings attention to creation alongside genealogy and relations, but it also reminds us of the ongoing percolation, changing, becoming of the people that I think of broadly for the future. To understand that future, though, we need to turn more fully to the past, including what contemporary technologies and human interpretations can help us to understand about that past, what stories genetics contributes to, and what stories communities already have and continue to grow. These are the stories that are beyond extinction. For these understandings through genetics, I turn to my esteemed colleagues to give a deeper context of its values for communities, its limits, how it can help define ties to ancestors, and how it may matter for the health and well-being of people.